through and go as much as we can into uh, the, the idea or the topic or the subject of grace, rightly divided. You find a lot of it, most of it, as far as when you go through and you go through that concordance we talked about when uh, and that topic of how to study the Bible, uh, the topic of uh, of uh, going through a concordance, looking up things word by word, you go through grace, you'll find most of it in Paul's epistles. But uh, uh, we can go, what's that? We'll go through and we'll see uh, Romans uh, chapter 11 in verse 6. Uh, we'll kind of start there as a, as a starting point. And we'll see that it says, uh, just as our verse to get started on, but this topical verse. And then since we're going through this today, um, anytime that you want to bring something up or you want to ask a question or make a comment or anything, you can go ahead and say something at, at any point. Um, we won't leave it to the end for questions. It's just at any time. Uh, but we see in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, says, And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. And then it goes on. You know, just mentioning this, that's kind of where we're starting out, just looking at that. But grace, um, a quick definition, is kind of unmerited favor, favor that you didn't earn. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't do the work, uh, therefore you, you benefit from it, and uh, you didn't deserve it. So that's the idea of unmerited favor. So we're going to start out and we're going to go back and look at the idea of grace, just as we went through in, on Wednesday, we looked at the idea of law uh, or commandments, you know, in time past, how that worked and how it came about and everything else. Uh, if we look all the way back at uh, Genesis chapter six, we'll kind of start there. We're looking at that time before the dispensation of promise. Uh, we're looking at Genesis chapter six you know, based on uh, you know, Galatians 3, talking about how the promises were given to Abraham. So we'll even go back before Abraham. And we'll look at Genesis chapter 6, and verse 7. And what we see here is, let's see if we can find it. Yeah. Genesis chapter 6, verse 7 talks about you know, the idea of there's, there's some grace here. And uh, what it says is in verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom uh, I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that uh, I have made them. Uh, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. So we see there in verse 8, it says, and Noah found grace. So it's not that uh, Jesus died on the cross and, and paid for his sins or anything. This event didn't happen yet. Not in Genesis 6 it didn't. So it wasn't that uh, you know, Noah was what Paul is, and nothing like that. Uh, this, as far as the um, progressive revelation of God's timeline, that's that's a long ways away from Genesis 6. But what we find here is, is grace. We find that Noah, in verse 8, found it. Noah found grace. And you know how does Noah find grace? We see in verse 9, says that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. <clears throat> so we're seeing that he walks with God, he's just, uh, he's doing things in order to find the grace. There's a performance that he's doing. You know, he's, Noah is not yet at the point where Moses is even in the progressive revelation of things where he's doing 613 points of law. That's not even there yet. But we are finding that Noah is doing things. He's got something that he's, you know, orienting himself to do. And even if you look at 2 Peter, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, you find a little bit more detail about Noah. And in 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 5, just to learn more, just to understand, oh, of course, we're not going there, we're going to obey Peter or anything, but we're going to learn from him. And we see in 2 uh, Peter, I think myself, chapter 2, verse 5, oops, goes on to read here. That uh, says, and spare not the old world, but save Noah, uh, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of uh, the ungodly. So you see a little more detail about who Noah is, what he's done. And not only was he just, not only did he walk with God, uh, he was a preacher of righteousness during a time where the whole world is, is completely sinful. And through his being a preacher of righteousness and walking godly and 
um, being a just man, being a perfect man, being perfect as in you're mature, that's another synonymous word with perfect. He's doing all these things and he's finding grace uh, with, with, with the Lord. Now, do they literally mean he is the eighth person? Uh, when they're saying that here, uh, not not so much the eighth person, but I think in the means of generations. Um, oh, like eighth generation? Yeah, some that type of a thing. But they are saying um, the eighth person, yeah, because there's going to be a lot more going on. That's what I thought. Yeah, it's going to go on uh, from there. But yeah, the eighth person, there's there's more into it than that. Okay, I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll read it. Yeah, yeah, but I, I'll want to dive deeper into that, you know, uh, a little bit later, but the eighth person um it's, it's probably saying you know, a lot more into it than, than this but uh what we're seeing about noah is that he is going forward and he's doing he's doing certain performances during a time where the world is literally you know acting out and rebelling against what god said to do and god's commandments and, and you know times during uh and even at the dispensation of promise god deals with individuals he deals with abraham he deals with job he deals with isaac he deals with uh, abel he deals well cain and abel deals with adam adam and he deals with individuals rather than entire the entire mankind like he's looking to do with today uh, so he's dealing with individuals in this case he's dealing with noah and noah is finding the grace uh in, you know, in the eyes of the lord noah found grace in the eyes of the lord he finds it so it's not that it's something that's being poured out. Uh, he just he goes and he finds it. He's earning it. Yeah. So we see that there. Uh, amongst you know this this certain time. So we see that in no in uh, Genesis chapter six, in uh, verse uh, seven, and we see why in verse eight and verse nine. But and this is the kind of idea that moves along in the scriptures uh, before we get to where we are today. If you look even further, Exodus chapter 33, verse 17. As it continues on, and you move on with uh, different people, uh, different times, but you're still in prophecy. And we are looking at uh, ideas of seeing the concept of grace. Exodus chapter uh, 33, verse 17. We get there, and we're seeing here when God's talking to Moses. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do uh, this thing also uh, that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee, excuse me, by name. <clears throat> and then it goes on from there. But you're seeing what God is saying to, to Moses. And Moses is, you know, someone that went out actually, and as you know, through the history of everything in the Bible that uh, has happened in, in the book of Exodus and even prior to that. That Moses has gone forth. He's 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 killed um, an Egyptian. He's done all these things. But yeah, he goes forth, and in his performance, he's finding grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so we see this, or in the sight of the Lord, I should say. And but he's finding it. It's not being poured out. It's not being dispensed. It's not you know he has he's going and he's finding it. Whereas today, you can go to in the dispensation of grace, you can go to into a prison where there's mass murderers and say, hey, grace is being poured out to you right now. And of course, you explain the mean. We'll get into that a little bit as to the means, as to the why, as to the how, as to the who. Uh, you know, we'll get to that in just a moment. And of course, we kind of already know the answers. But uh, here, they're finding it. This is this is Noah. This is Moses. Uh, in prophecy, they're going and they're finding it. They're kind of like the exception to the rule almost. Uh, they're finding this grace in which God is talking to them. God is dealing with them. God is working with them. God is giving them instructions. You know, with Noah, he's essentially saying, look, I'm going to flood this earth. This earth is wicked. This earth is filled with uh, people who are rebellious. Uh, but with you, you found grace with me, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you to go ahead and build an ark. And so, you know, you're finding things like this. And, uh, you know, with Moses, he's, you know, when you think about the uh, Old Testament, you always think of a God that is nothing but wrathful and vengeful and angry and, and so on and so forth. But you're finding that God is actually doing a lot of graceful things and merciful things in the Old Testament. You're finding that he could have destroyed Israel half a million times for all the wicked things they did and all the rebellious things that they had done and all the uh, uh, wicked gods that they had worshipped, false gods that they had worshipped, yet he didn't do that, and his law said that he could. They had entered into a covenant where God had every right to destroy Israel over and over and over again, 
and yet he was graceful enough uh, not to do so. Uh, we see just you know, examples of this through uh, the Bible here. Even the idea that God, as he in the dispensation of promise, uh, we know that as we had studied last week, uh, building on what we had learned in, say, on Wednesday, that uh, because of transgressions, God had uh, uh, given them the law. As this new nation is coming about from their Egyptian exodus, or from Egypt, and they're coming out into the wilderness, uh, there's all these trans transgressions that are abounding. We know that from 1 Corinthians, all of chapter 10, just about. And so they go forth, and they, they're, they're constantly sinning. God sets up these 613 points of law. And, you know, even through that, at that point in time, in the dispensation of law, coming out of the dispensation of promise, even giving them laws to obey was a gracious thing. Of course, that's not for us to do today, but for them, the different people at different times with a different purpose and God's timeline, that was a gracious thing to do. They needed structure. They needed order. If they had continued in their rebelliousness, if they had continued without a set of commands, a set of laws, 613 points of law, their transgressions would continue to run out of order. And so God gave them 613 points of law, and that for them was a gracious thing, was a right thing to do. And yet all they had to do is still say, you know, we can't obey all this. We need to depend on you. And that was the point of the law was to, uh, you know, bring them to God, have, have them depend on God. And that even worked out for them, you know, later, 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 uh, so to speak. So God's continuously and wisely setting up ways to be merciful and graceful uh, to people. So we see that there. And then uh, even Jeremiah talks about all of this in uh, Exodus chapter 33, going through the wilderness with Moses and everything else. It's Jeremiah 31, verse 8. And he kind of talks about this in that verse uh, about Moses and Israel in the wilderness. But it's uh, Jeremiah 31. And if you turn there in verse 8, uh, what we're going to see here is the mentioning of this. Let's get there real quick. And what you see here. Jeremiah 31, verse 8. Let me find it here. And he goes on to say that, uh, Behold, mm -hmm. I will bring them uh, from the north country and gather them from the coasts of uh, the earth, and uh, with them the uh, blind and the lame, uh, the woman with child, and her the trail of the child together. Uh, a great company shall return hither. Uh, let's see if we can. This is the right one I got here. Um, I think I might have gotten this one a little bit off. Uh, let's see. 32. Let me check if I got that right. Yeah, I think I got the wrong verse. But there's one here that talks about how Israel goes through. And they do have, uh, there's it 18. Uh, uh, well, I think I might have gotten this verse off a little bit, but they do go through talking about how there is grace given to them uh, through the fact of them going through uh, the wilderness that they go through with Moses. And uh, I might have just been off by a verse or two here when I was writing all this down. And uh, let's see if I can find it. Is it, uh... yeah, I think I was off on this, but uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. It was pretty much through Moses, just as we're seeing it through Noah, that we're seeing that there's this grace that they're finding, but they do have to go and find it. Even as we continue when we move up the uh, prophecy program, if you look at Ruth, the book of Ruth chapter 2 verse 2, you're finding Gentiles that join up with Israel. Ruth chapter 2 verse 2, the idea of that, that we see, is that they join up and they become a part of, uh, or Ruth joins up with what Israel uh, has in store, and becomes a part of uh, you know, uh, Israel and all that they're doing in prophecy. So we get there as well. And uh, what we find when, when we get to this, just get there. Oops. Yeah, we're pretty much seeing. Ah, where to go? Is that when in Ruth 2 2, you're seeing that the. Uh, Moabitess, 
she's from she's from Moab, and she as a Gentile comes in and joins up with what's uh, happening in uh, in this plan as well. She she too because of her obedience uh, and her willingness to stay with everybody uh, doesn't or sorry joins up with Israel and and fails uh, it doesn't fail to uh, leave. Now she does this here. She and she finds grace. She finds it just as Job has. I'm sorry, just as Noah has, just as uh, David has. Uh, we'll get to David in a minute. Just as Moses has, she finds grace by being obedient uh, to what's being said in the prophecy program. And that's uh, Ruth chapter two, verse two. I just want to give that up for you there. Uh, but as it continues on, you continue to see in this. Old Testament program. In the prophecy program, you're finding people finding grace. Just the fact that grace is not only uh, mentioned in the dispensation of grace, but you're seeing how the fact that it's there and to whom it's being given to, it's being given to those that find it. And as they go through to find it, they're doing things that are right. And as they do so, uh, it's happening according to the fact that they're having faith in God and his laws and his covenants and the things that he's saying to have or in the dispensation of promise, they're having faith in the promises that God is promising or that they're going through. And even before the promise, they're having faith in his commands and in his instructions. And when they do so, uh, that looks good in God's sight and they find grace accordingly. So, so we see that there. It continues on. Uh, not only with Noah, not only with Moses, not only with Ruth, uh, but if we look even at uh, Psalm 84, verse 11. Now we're moving on to what I had mentioned briefly, uh, King David. As you go through this Old Testament, you find that there is grace, but people have to find it. And yet God is a graceful, merciful, loving God during... Old Testament times, just as he is, you know, God is you know, always the same, but how he deals with mankind is, is different. So in uh, Psalm uh, 84, verse 11, get there as well. And what we see here, he says, uh, for the Lord God is the sun and shear, the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So again, you've seen the idea that the Lord will give grace and glory, uh, but the the uh, the catch, so to speak, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So you got to walk uprightly in order to get that grace, and that's covenant standing. That's uh, conditional, uh, and that's how it should be in prophecy. We find this here. So we're seeing this being said here, and as it continues on, we know it's a, the idea of King David. We're moving into uh, along God's timeline. We're looking at different people where God will, uh, you know, be gracious and uh, merciful. And so we're seeing this uh, play out here, and it's all to serve Him. It's all it's all for God and His glory. We see that King David, based on you know covenant standing, and we can read all about these covenant standings in uh, Leviticus chapter 26, 27, and 28. The whole chapter is talking about blessings and cursings and everything based on a covenant. And then uh, it goes on to even talk about with King David and the issues that he had, where he had actually uh, you know watched Bathsheba, taken her, and sent her uh, husband uh, to death so that he could have uh, Bathsheba for himself. Uh, as a result, he was living under law, and you know those laws, he could be punishable by death and should have been, uh, but we find in uh, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 3, something that occurred as a result, or something that happened instead. You know that David was a man after God's own heart, and yet was sinful, had, you know, committed sin. And that's not, you know, uh, a contradiction of thing, that's just that he has a sin-cursed nature and was a man after God's own heart. We see in verse 3 of Isaiah 55, he says that, Incline your ear and come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. And so, of course, as he goes on, and uh, this is being said in Isaiah 55, 3, you're seeing a phrase there, a phrase or a term that's called the sure mercies of David. And that's you know, something where you're finding grace being extended to someone who deserves to be punished under law, if not murdered, if not you know, killed, and so on, for the things that he's done. Instead, he's being shown the sure mercies of David, 
you know, specifically, this is a terminology given to King David, uh, and which this is what later leads on to what you find in Romans. But this happens here, talking about the sure mercies of David. It even gets said in Acts chapter 13. If you look at Acts chapter 13, verse 33. Talking again about the sure mercies of David as we're moving along God's timeline from Noah, Moses, Ruth. You see in King, uh, King David's time, and these are not everybody in the Old Testament, so I'm kind of going through things a little bit uh, quickly picking out specific people. There's more than this, so I don't want to limit it to just who we're talking about here. More so, I want to show the examples of grace that we're looking at. But the fact is, they're going out and they're finding it. So, uh, Acts chapter 13, and we see in verse uh, 33, it says that God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again. As uh, it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. <clears throat> as it, and, and as concerning that he raised him uh, up from the dead, now no more to return uh, to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Uh, wherefore he sa saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. And that, that's normal. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to explain that, uh, and by him all that believe are justified from all things that ye, or from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Explaining them. Uh, David and the sure mercies of David and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and how you're justified by him, not the works of the law. And uh, so we're seeing this uh, play out here, but you do see the sure mercies of David in verse 34 mentioned again, just as it's mentioned in Isaiah 55. And uh, this is an explanation of, of grace that was given to David uh, in spite of what he did and who he was. So we're seeing this uh, take place here. And, uh, if we look at the Romans, now this is why it comes up. Romans chapter 4, verse 7. Romans chapter 4, verse 7. As, as Paul goes through and he and has this book under inspiration, you know, written, this is where um, we see he says, even as David also described it, the blessedness, verse 6, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works saying in verse 7, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So he goes forth and, and you're saying, he's kind of quoting David on this. One of, one of the Psalms, I believe Psalm 32, goes through and explains that this is what David is saying. And he's saying this because this is an example of the sure mercies of David. David is the one who goes through and says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. You know, people will say, well, how could that happen to King David? You know, how, how has this happened? And, you know, they had 613 laws. They had a program where they could sacrifice a bull or a goat or, or uh, whatever it may be for sin. But David had something more given to him. And it was something that he had found by being who he was, a man after God's own heart. And uh, nonetheless, you're seeing an example of grace you know, from, from God who is loving, merciful graceful. And yet, you know, we don't want to just limit it to that because, you know, a lot of different uh, religious groups will say God is love and therefore everything can be whatever you want it to be. And that's the excuse they use to manipulate what they want you to think God is. Uh, God is love, as we know this from uh, 1 John 4 and, and uh, so on and so forth. He's gracious, he's merciful and everything else, but he also has a sense of justice, wisdom, truth, and that demands you know, certain things to take place, which is why we find what we find, that God you know, executes vengeance and will do so in uh, the book of Revelation. And that uh, even when we go through Paul's epistles, he doesn't say, you know, let yourself be a doormat or uh, things like this. There are, there are instructions given so that we understand how things are supposed to take place according to Paul's uh, epistles and specific instructions. So we see that in... Uh, Romans 4, going back to King David, that these are the things that Paul writes based on the things that David said. And he's using it 
for the uh, case uh, for God's grace in, R in Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> so we see that there. And this actually comes uh, through, uh, if we look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, in verse 12. This is actually where this is all coming about. 2 Samuel chapter 7, in verse 12. And I think it's going to be in verse uh, 7. I'm sorry, 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. Got that mixed up. 2 Samuel 7, 12. What we see here. Yes, yeah, 7, 12. Reads that, uh, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of uh, the children of men. For my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Uh, according to uh, according to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So you're seeing more built on what we had kind of looked at uh, uh, roughly last week with Genesis chapter 12. Uh, this is building on these things that are occurring, and you know, this is kind of called more of so the Davidic covenant. But you're seeing more of this grace being poured out to David, and it all plays out for the glory of God. But this is just more examples of how this is working out, uh, an example of God's grace. And you're finding people earning it, people finding it. And this is working out for there. So and we look at things like this, and yet uh, we find just more examples of how in the Old Testament, you're not finding God to be this uh, bitter, upset, um, uh, vengeful God who just wants to kill everybody and hates everybody and just... Nothing like that at all. We're finding that God is a compassionate, merciful, he's full of grace. And he's, uh, you know, in dealing with Israel and everybody in the Old, in the old Testament time period. There's different dispensations during that time. If we look at Psalm 78, 38. For example, you'll see this being spoken of God like this. Psalm 78, 38. The example to understand God, whether it be... Uh, the dispensation of promise, the dispensation of law, uh, dispensation of, of course, grace, dispensation of the kingdom, or dispensation of the forms of times. We're seeing an example being laid out, say, in the dispensation of law or, or promise, a description. In Psalm 78, verse 38, it uh, goes on to read, And he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. You know, this is more so talking about Israel and all the things that they did and all the things, all the times he could have destroyed Israel for all their silliness and their foolishness and their griping and their whining and their crying in the wilderness and every other way that they had gone and worshipped false gods and created uh, idolatry. If you uh, read the Bible from front to back, you'll see there's so many times Israel turned away from God. God had every right under their agreement, a.k.a. their covenant, a.k.a. Uh, their Old Testament, he had every right to destroy them, and yet he turned his back, as we see here uh, in verse 38. Uh, he turned his anger, I should turn his back, turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. So he maybe stir, stirred up the right amount of wrath to teach them a lesson, whatever it may be, whatever that lesson was. Uh, but he didn't pour it out in full, otherwise uh, you'd read how Israel is completely annihilated, destroyed, whatever it may be, and you don't find that. So God is gracious. God is merciful. God is loving. God is caring to do what needs to be done in an incredibly wise way. And you never hear this being taught about God when you're studying the Old Testament. And uh, so we're building on the understanding that there was grace in the Old Testament with God. And we're reading about this, and, uh, and uh, we see this here. So... We see the same. If you look at Psalm 145, while, while we're here in the Psalm, Psalm 145, verse 8. As we continue on looking at some examples or evidence 
or verses dealing with grace. Psalm 145 and verse 8. goes on to describe uh, explanations or examples. It says that the Lord is gracious. And we see it again, more descriptions of who is, how others viewed the Lord while being under law, while being in an agreement or a testament with him. And they said, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Now, the Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over uh, all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. And then, of course, they say, they shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom. So again, we're looking at that earthly kingdom. We're seeing it's all about prophecy, under law, Israel. So, so we're getting all the understandings of where it all fits. But we're seeing that, uh, nonetheless, they're saying, God, this is a very gracious God we have here. They're saying this when you read it in the Psalms. And when you read it, uh, you know, going back to Genesis and Noah and Ruth and Moses and so on, uh, of course, it's all you know, talking about different dispensations, whether it's the dispensation of promise, dispensation of law. You're seeing it's not us. It's not the dispensation of grace. That's yet and upcoming. But nonetheless, we're seeing how it is all about God's grace nonetheless. So just it's people are finding it through their performance, through their behavior, through what's, what they need to be doing. As they have faith in covenants, as they have faith in testaments, and faith in rules and laws, uh, they're finding it. And, uh, and yet these people aren't perfect. And yet they're finding grace. So we see that there. And so uh, he still hates sin. God still hates sin. Uh, leaves room for justice, wrath, anger. And uh, will come in this prophecy program, as it's mentioned, there are all sorts of different books. He will come in Revelation 19.11 with, to make war and wrath, bring about earthquakes and uh, locusts and storms and everything and so forth. And he will make war with the Antichrist and everything else. Yet we're finding grace. Even when that happens, that's graceful. And we're going to get to that just now. Uh, grace and so we will, as we look at the ages to come, and you've got the little flock of Israel. You've got the believers. Uh, believing Gentiles that either join up with Israel or on their own, they understand that they need to believe in the living God. Uh, we see there in, say, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, what God says to them uh, through Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12, in verse 10, mentions, if you get there, it's going to be talking about uh, what happens to not only the house of David, so again, we're mentioning King David or the house of David that we saw in 2 Samuel 7. But it's going back to David and everyone else. And it's also talking about the inhabitants of Jerusalem during the future time. And it says there, and I will, and from Zechariah's viewpoint, it's going to happen in the future. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And uh, they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for uh, his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. But now he will pour out the spirit of grace, and uh, he'll do so. And it's going to be a graceful thing to set up, a th uh, set up the kingdom. It's going to be a graceful thing to fulfill and to carry out Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, to set up blessings and then descendants and inheritance and, and everything else that we find in Genesis 12 for Israel. And it's going to be a graceful thing that he sets all this up and he goes through and he does all this. Uh, grace is prophesied in the Old Testament. Even if you look at Luke chapter 1, in verse uh, 68. In uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 68. And we see that Jesus comes on the scene. Luke chapter 1, verse 68, and we're seeing that it's it's graceful to have a Messiah. It's graceful that he shows up and that this is all part of uh, the prophecy program and that this is all part of, of uh, prophecy. It says there that, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, that's Israel, and, uh, hath, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, imagining David. And he, uh, as he spake by the mouth of of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. 
So of course we're not where we are. We're in a program which was hid since the world began, but now revealed. Yeah, we're seeing it's graceful, but they have their Messiah. The Messiah will come and uh, take away Israel's sin. Uh, and their sin will be everything from either being in agreement with the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, everything else, and, and a lot more. He'll destroy all these things, destroy all these idolatry, uh, idolatrous uh, issues, and images that will be around. He'll destroy all these things. He'll make war with these things. He'll destroy the Antichrist. That will be a gracious thing that he does that and then brings in the kingdom and fulfills all that for the Lord of God. If we look even at uh, what Peter has to say, this is how we know things are so different. If we look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, as we go into the ages to come, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. And we go through there. First Peter chapter 1, verse 10 goes on to talk about uh, the little flock, or this is written to the little flock, and anyone else who reads it, uh, in the ages to come. It's going to say, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, uh, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So again, he's mentioning that there's, this, there's going to be this grace that should come a future a future event future event of grace and that's going to be that grace where we know from romans 11 talks about how god will have a savior come and take away sin from israel all that sin that's in there you know mark of the beast antichrist uh economic system idolatrous uh, images being worshipped and everything that's counter to the prophetic program of god that'll be all removed we also see there uh, him mentioning uh, so much more in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 that familiar verse God will also lift the entire uh, curse of sin we know that from Isaiah chapter 11 I'll leave that whole entire chapter for you to read how um, the entire uh, curse of uh, curse of sin will just be lifted off the earth and that's a graceful thing it's a very graceful thing but we won't uh, be here for that but nonetheless, that's an example in the ages to come of God's grace in uh, prophecy. And so we see that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, about the grace that should come and that will come for them. And even in verse 13, it says, Wherefore, in 1 Peter 1, verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's when it's to come it at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when people read prophecy with mystery and they mix mystery with prophecy and they mix the two things up and they were to say read Romans through Philemon or Romans, Ephesians, Galatians, and our books. And then they go and read say First Peter and they think that the grace should come at a later time. They're going to mix the timing. They're going to mix the dates. They're going to mix what's happening. They're going to think well this grace should happen later. So that means it doesn't happen now. So in mixing the verses, they're going to say, well, I must have to earn something. I must have to do something. I must not really be saved. I must, my salvation must not be uh, set in stone. I must not have, you know, uh, eternal security. Because 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 says it should come later. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says it will be given to me at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so they read the verses, they mix their identity, they mix their purpose, they mix their understanding of who they are and when the grace is supposed to come. And they can go easily into Paul's epistles, read all about grace, and wrongly divide the word of truth when it comes to grace. So, uh, so we see that we see that a lot in uh, different churches, group, religious groups, radio shows, television shows that have to do with Christianity. So you'll see that there. But if you look at First Peter chapter four, verse ten, another reason why people may go to Peter saying, well, Peter and Paul say the same message. Peter and Paul, let me see if I got that right. I have a lot of things. Uh, is it 410? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, First Peter chapter 4, verse 10. They may say that Peter says the same thing as Paul, or Peter is the same thing as Paul. They may combine the two and go to First Peter 1, 10, 1 Peter 1, 13, because First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So they would read that and they would just say, oh, well, wow, looks like we are all stewards of the manifold grace of God, as Peter says. 
Therefore, let's do what Peter says. Let's read what Peter says. Let's obey what Peter says. And let's you know, run with what Peter says. Just because he has the word grace and then he's saying we're all stewards of the manifold grace of God. But again, that grace of God in prophecy is going to be that he's going to vanquish all the sin out of Israel, and if not the world, and set up a kingdom for the prophetic program. Just as it's been prophesied since the world began. We're not in that program. We're in a program that's been hid since the world began, but is now revealed and, and given to the Apostle Paul. So we see that play out here. And uh, we know that even if we look at Romans chapter 11, verse 25, and we know through our study on Romans, that took us a while to do verse by verse, Romans 9, 10, and 11 talks about Israel, their past, present, and future. So in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, when Paul talks about Israel, Paul talks about Israel's future. He says this in Romans chapter 11, verse 25. We're looking at grace, God's grace, not only in the past, but also in the future. How people find it. He says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened excuse me, to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, uh, that's very graceful, and shall uh, turn, away, turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. That's concerning, or it continues on from there. But you're seeing it uh, even mentioned by Paul here. So when we see that God gave the law to Moses, that was a graceful thing in their testament there. But even when, and we've read these verses before, Jeremiah 31, 31, God writes the law into their hearts. That's what the New Testament is for the little flock of Israel and anyone that joins up with them. That, that those 613 points of law will be able to be carried out because God will supernaturally write the law into their heart and they'll be able to carry those laws out supernaturally. And that's uh, Ezekiel 36, 25 and Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. I just want to give those verses out or we won't turn to them. But I'll give those cross references out nonetheless for you to refer to them. And uh, that's a graceful thing, too, during the time when God is just merciful, loving, and uh, kind to do what he does. And so when, people, when you explain that to people, people think, well, you know, I, I thought there was an angry God here, but a nice God now. And God has always been gracious, compassionate, mercy, loving, slow to anger. And God is who God is. As we're understanding how he deals with people in different dispensations at different times, uh, we're seeing that here. God may deal with law or with people under law in one uh, dispensation. And as we uh, look here, God is now dealing with grace. As we see in Romans uh, chapter 11, we're seeing Paul. Now we're going to look even more. We kind of saved the best for last. Looking at uh, grace, rightly divided, we just looked at it through time past, how people had to find it. Uh, Noah, Moses, Ruth. King David, and even in the future, as uh, people go through and they uh, they join up with the little flock of Israel, they repent, they get water baptized, they confess their sins, they confess that Jesus Christ is God. That's Romans 10, 9 and 10, based on Matthew 12, 32. Uh, they get water baptized, and they, they confess, and they become part of the little flock of Israel. Uh, we see that as a part of these things happening in the prophetic program, whether it be time past or ages to come, we see now that rather than being in a dispensation of promise or a dispensation of the kingdom or a dispensation of uh, law, that uh, in this dispensation of grace, it's not that people find it. It's that it's revealed completely because the devil's trying to hide the fact that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that uh, that's what this whole thing means, is that uh, we're living in a whole dispensation of grace now. And so this is how we, when we rightly divide the word of truth, uh, we're living in a whole time of God is now pouring out his grace. And it's not because we're so amazing or so wonderful. He wants us to run wild. It's that he wants us to understand that's what the cross means. That's what the death, burial, and resurrection means. Is that uh, he's, he's doing so so that we can go forth and serve him and his purposes in the dispensation of grace. And of course, in every dispensation, we find people failing to understand uh, the purposes, and we find the devil trying to counterfeit his purposes, and so uh, we find this here, but again, that goes back to Romans chapter 11, verse 6, you know, uh, grace and works, 
But if you look also at Romans chapter 3, verse 25, Romans chapter 3, verse 25 explains a lot of great detail. A lot of good words in there, too. A lot of good $10 words. It says that, uh, actually, we'll move up to verse 24. We'll go to Romans 3, 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which is which believeth in Jesus. Whereas boasting then, it is excluded. By what law? Of works, nay, but by the law of great uh, faith. I'm sorry. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And it goes on, reads this here in Romans chapter 3. So we see a lot about this here. We look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, another you know, well-quoted, you know, very famous uh, verse, pretty much known everywhere, but the whole point of it, of why we're going here, and why it builds up into this, is uh, Ephesians 2, 8, goes on to say, for by grace are ye saved through faith, uh, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And of course, Noah couldn't say this, David couldn't say this, that he was saved, but yet the show mercies of David, you know, showed a lot of grace, showed a, showed a great deal of it. And so that's why the show of mercies of David was something that the little flock could read about and uh, learn something from. And so when they saw, you know, we learn from that too, but we're seeing that we're in an entire dispensation where we can go to anybody on planet Earth and explain this to them today. No matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter what's happened to them, we can explain that Christ died for their sins. We can give them the good news, the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and explain it to them. And explain we are living in a dispensation of grace it's not that god likes sin now he doesn't he's again the same he's god god hasn't changed but how he deals with man has changed and we are now living in the calm before the storm and god will come in revelation 19 11 he will make war and he will uh set up his kingdom and, and uh go to war with all those who are against him but right now uh you know, he's set up a, a dispensation where he allows everybody to come to him. They just they have to believe in the terms that God has sent us out as ambassadors to go out and tell people. And so we are the ambassadors on the scene right now, dispensing uh, what God is telling us to do, which is you know, information and grace, and, and uh, this is what we do. So we see that in verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in it. So we're seeing that God does have a plan where we are to go out there and do some good works, and not at all for our salvation, but understanding that we've been saved and we are living in the dispensation of grace. Where God does consider right behavior a good thing and wrong behavior a bad thing. And yet he's not going to uh, you know, send down a lightning bolt if we do something bad. But he does allow us to learn and grow and understand what needs to be done because he's given us a book, a complete book that we can learn and, and read from and understand it and therefore go out and do that which is right by God. So, and that's graceful. We see that here. Of course, we know uh, those, those are the means by grace. We know that grace doesn't come by sacraments or religion or the law. We know that from the book of Galatians. Galatians 2.21 talks about that. And so we see that there as well. So we're no more going to go out and try to find grace. We're living in an entire dispensation of it. And staying in Ephesians, if you look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul goes on to say this. Paul goes on to say, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, I held that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Noah, David, Ruth, uh, Moses, wasn't made known unto them. It says, uh, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, of course, they found grace as their performance you know, merited it, or as their performance, you know, they found it. It wasn't their entire dispensation. And other people didn't find it in that dispensation. Now it's being poured out to all. To all. 
and uh, people can choose to believe it or not. And if they don't believe it, they're kind of, they're going off road from what God is doing today, and they're going into other things, which is the devil's lie program. The devil would be thrilled to have everybody in the church somewhere trying to get into the earthly kingdom. The devil would be thrilled if all they did was read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and believe it, ignoring Paul, or mixing Paul, or thinking they belong in somewhere they don't belong. As long as they're not saved, as long as they're not studying and reading and understanding and believing the Bible, that's what the devil wants. So as long as they're believing they're somewhere else, uh, water baptizing, tithing, and doing other things that belong to the kingdom, the prophetic program, and they think that's their identity, spiritual Israel, replacement Israel, literal Israel, all those different theologies we had talked about, uh, instructing those that oppose themselves, then the devil's happy with that. And when we come about and we explain to people, and we instruct those that oppose themselves, that's when uh, the devil gets upset. So we see that there, and that's the Second Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 4 line program that the devil has. So we see that in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to you know, my works, is not what it says. It says, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And it even says in verse 8, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So we see that even all things by Jesus Christ shows that uh, if, you, if you think even back to the beginning, it is graceful that God created everything. That's uh, one more thing. You know, he created everything in wisdom and righteousness. And that was, you know, the devil ruined that. But what God created is good and gracious. And just think about things, you know, something to that effect. So we see that there. But, uh, you know, a lot of people will take grace or the grace message or what Paul is teaching, you call it greasy grace. And say that, you know, you're, since you're not uh, working to uh, you know, earn salvation, you, you believe in this cheap grace, or this greasy grace, or this type of grace where, you know, you're not, you don't really uh, have any zeal towards God. You don't have any focus on God. You just believe in that, you know, that death, burial, and resurrection, and that's it. You don't believe in, you know, this or that. You don't believe in earning this, or you don't believe in the laws of God. You don't believe in, and they like to spin it so that they think that you are just, you know, skating by or whatever it may be. That's their way of thinking. But it costs the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, our salvation. The blood was spilled for you. The blood was spilled for me. And, it's, and when we apply that and think that into our common knowledge, based on the scriptures rightly divided, we understand that there is someone who died for us and blood was spilled on our behalf. And uh, that's, that's grace. That's the reality of it. So we see that there. And that we can't Usually the person saying that will somehow think that their works will merit something better than the cross. And that's insanity. So, so we took a little bit about finding you know, finding grace in time past. How grace is you know, even, even found how people will find it in ages to come and how graceful it will be when God does what he does. Merciful, graceful. How God is described as being graceful and merciful whether it be in the past or in, in the future, and how even now we're living in an entire dispensation of grace and how that suits God's purposes before he does what he does. So I wanted to go through a quick uh, overview or brush of grace because we looked at law on Wednesday. I figured we'd uh, look at grace, you know, law and grace, kind of look at the two ideas of it and uh, see if there's any questions or kind of go from there based on these, based on these topics here. So... I figured I'd wrap up a little bit early and see whether there are any questions or thoughts based on, on this topic. I'm glad you made that clarification about what grace was in time past. Because it, it makes it so much clearer that um, it, it required works in time past. It required something. Time pass. It doesn't require it today. It's given freely. Yes. So that that's that's made it 
that's made it pretty clear, uh, at least for me. I mean, I know there was times in time past when grace was given, but it was it was worked for. It wasn't given freely. Uh, you found it because you had to do something to find it. If you if you're doing something to find grace, you're working, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Which is consistent with what we know and what the Bible teaches us as far as time past and back now. Yeah. A lot of people think that they, they mix the two. And if you don't rightly divide the scriptures, you kind of think that's what's going on today is that I'm going to find grace by going to church, paying some tithing, uh, act, do, the sacraments. do sacraments, act <laughs> holy, act self-righteous or just right, whatever they want to call it, act religious. And by doing these things, I'm going to start earning up my grace and earning up my uh, reward, rewards of grace. And, and you do, when you, when you go out and serve, that's when you're going to give an account for what you do at the judgment seat of Christ, both good and bad, and you're, you're accounted for based on that. But as far as uh, people think that the more I do, the more I show up at church every week at 10 o'clock in a building on Sunday with people and so on, uh, I mean, if, if, and if that's what you want to do, you, you do it, but you do it because you purpose it in your heart, just like 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7 talk about. You do what you do, whatever it is, whether it's right or wrong, because you purpose it in your heart. That's how it should be. And if you're saved, you'll give an account for it. Even if you're lost, you're going to give an account for it. You're just going to give an account at the great white throne rather than at the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, nonetheless, that's uh, the whole point. But grace is not something that you're going to go and you're going to go and try and find it. And, and uh, you know, it's not that type of thing. It's, it's being freely dispensed right now. You just have to understand the terms. And the terms are the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ being a fully sufficient payment for your sins. So when someone says, well, Christ did 50%, you have to do the other 50%. That's not true. It's the, the death, burial, and resurrection is an absolutely fully sufficient payment for you, for our sins. Not only is that not true, that's not grace. Right, it's not grace. Yeah. That means you didn't earn it. That's right. It's not given to you freely. Or it's not you, given had to you, freely. To, you had to do something. Right, right, right. Exactly. <clears throat> so yeah yep so yeah that's why we went back we kind of looked at these different topics you know instructing those that oppose themselves um, you know, how to study the bible uh, law rightly divided grace rightly divided revelation rightly divided we're just looking at different topics every every Sunday, every Wednesday. We're looking at different things. We're going to look at different topics just for you know, a little while, kind of kind of dive into the scriptures that helps us study the Bible and see when things are happening in the Bible, different things. You know, oh, that's why that might be. This is why this is happening the way this is happening. That's what that phrase means. That's what that this part means here. So we can go in and, and read it, and as we dive into it, we understand things a little bit better. This is a good study because it differentiates what grace is in prophecy and what grace is in mystery. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still grace. It's still God. It's still grace. Still God. Yeah. yeah. It's different yeah. people. Yeah. Different people, different dispensations, different times. Yeah. And that's, that's why we do these studies is to kind of shine more, give more information, shine more light on certain topics. And even if there's a uh, disagreement or you need more understanding, this is just to get you going with it. And you take it from there. You grow, you pick out what's not right according to what you may be studying. And you add to it based on where you are studying. And you grow from there. You go from there. You learn from it. And then hopefully, you know, you give an account at the judgment seat of Christ from what we're learning here and what we're doing together. And uh, we all grow together. And let the Bible be the final authority on all that we're doing. So... Very good. So, any other thoughts or comments or anything on what we're doing or questions? I just wanted to share, or I got a thousand things in my head going around right now that I can't, I've been trying to verbalize them about today's study. So I'm sorry. I just, I'm trying to figure out how to say it. I can't, I can't get it out. <laughs> okay. But I, I will share, um, a little bit of what kind of came to my mind yesterday um and i guess it's just you know grace and scriptures kind of working in my in my own life and making me see things more clearly 
um, because I probably would have been one of these people uh, years ago doing what's kind of going on right now. Um, but I've noticed like everything is being pointed out right now, like whether it be Facebook or other social media, people are just like tearing stuff apart, like like this <clears throat> this new Disney Cruella movie. Like I've seen people in my own friends list, like that's got the things of the devil in it, and they're talking about the devil. And then you've got you know the shoes that came out not too long ago. Those they're devil shoes, and they're glorifying the devil. And and I just I, I guess it just came to me yesterday and I was like, people are so, they're so deceived in themselves and they're so self-righteous that they don't even see that what they're doing when they point that stuff out is creating more, um, creating more chaos than it is good because it's doing nothing. I mean, sin, sin, this is the devil's earth. I mean, it's his that kind of stuff's going to happen in this kind of sinful world. And, you know, and I got to thinking about it and I was like, if they put that much energy into trying to spread the gospel and save people and let people's hearts be changed, then it would be different. And, and they would be doing something more productive than what they're doing right now. But I, I just see it and I'm like, these people, man, they, I mean, yes, that's, crazy and I you know oh well you don't have to watch it if you don't want to but you know everywhere you turn and everything you do even the people that are posting this I'm like y'all celebrate Halloween I mean, do you think that's Jesus's time to go get candy or something I mean yeah. or, or you watch rated R movies where they're cussing or they're having affairs and you're watching this kind of thing do you not think that's the devil's handiwork i mean the devil's everywhere he's in everything no matter how clean or how transparent it is whether it's you can see it right there that 666 is on her car tag in a movie or something or somebody's having an affair in another movie i mean it's the same thing it's 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 sin but you got these people pointing it out and creating a squabble about it when they're not putting any energy into trying to spread the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just, I, they just came to me. I mean, I just started looking at that like, wow, this is more deception upon more deception, you know? And, and not only that, the people that are doing it that have unsaved people following them or listening to what they have to say, all they're doing is making themselves look judgmental. When Jesus is, he already dealt with sin. Sin is dealt with. Everything that's going on is dealt with. But nobody wants to look at sharing the gospel. And I just, I just found that interesting this week that I thought, had that thought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good to be, it's good to be uh, judgmental and discerning. And that's a good thing on, on that point. But like you said, it's also more so to get souls saved it's 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 wiser to see souls saved it's wiser to go out there with the gospel uh, so it, it's all on how we uh you know tackle it and handle it but the but first timothy 2 4 is, is you know what we're here to do as ambassadors to get the gospel out make sure people right. they, they're, at least they're hearing the gospel uh having the gospel presented to them in some way shape or form and uh, in order to get there you have to you know depending on where we're at we're going to go through a whole mess of uh, sin in order to get to the heart of the matter in one way or another. But uh, yeah, like you said, it's everywhere. And in order to get the gospel to someone, we're going to have to you know, work our way through some uh, issues. It's not that we isolate ourselves away from everyone, but go out there and get the gospel out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good point, Lorraine, because <clears throat> Leslie, I'm sorry, Leslie, I think that's a good point, Leslie, because uh, what you're what you're saying is the more you study and the more you become aware of things, the more you see things happening that are less understandable, but you can understand them. They make more sense to you because because what you know now compared to what you knew before just makes so much more sense. Yes. And being more yeah. Aware. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I wouldn't have even, and, and I guess that's me pointing out my own 
my own fault. Like I know, like I would have been one of them a couple of years ago, just saying stuff like, Oh, that's horrible. That movie's horrible. And this is just terrible, but I wouldn't have given anybody the gospel at all. You know, it's like I would have taken it on. Sorry, I got a, I got a toddler in here with me. <laughs> anyway, I, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have thought to give the gospel as, as a solution to this problem. You know, like, why am I sitting here squabbling about sin that has already been dealt with instead of trying to help these people be saved? You know, some of these fr people around me, and then once they're saved, let them realize, you know, they need to help others be saved. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, that's what it's all about for, for us today. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's a good point to be discerning, too. We still want to discern and understand there's a lot of wrong things and what the wrong things are. So it's not that we're oh, yeah. So, you know, it's not like I'm saying that I'm okay with all this and right, let right. it be and it'll, and it'll run amok and be okay. Yeah. It's just saying like, if we would put more energy into, you know, working toward giving the gospel out, you know, I know these people aren't going out and handing out tracks and they're not doing that kind of thing. They're sitting and squabbling over sin that's been dealt with. Yeah. You know, and yes, we need to discern that it is sin, but. I just, I just found it kind of counterproductive. Yeah. 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 Good point. Yeah. That makes, that makes sense. I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah any, any other thoughts or questions or any, anything at all? So, yeah. Yeah, what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. We'll be back here uh, Wednesday and Sunday. We'll we'll find some more topics. Uh, if anyone wants to throw them into the chat room or anything in general, we'll keep going through some topics. We'll whether it be grace or law rightly divided or something totally different that we'll keep moving on to. We'll keep having the topics, and uh, yeah, hopefully this was helpful for you. This was instructive. This gave some more insight that you can kind of go with and run with in your own personal studies. And uh, we'll keep doing more. We'll keep doing more until we go back to verse by verse studies in a certain specific book of the Bible. But yeah, we'll wrap up here and uh, we'll be back here Wednesday and Sunday. All right, so. Bye bye, everybody. All right, we'll see you later. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining.